good evening and night. Um, so yeah, what I want to talk about today a little bit, uh, let me put these slides up here and share my screen, um, is uh, this project that I work on called Cascada. So Cascada is an event processing system uh, that we built for a number of different use cases, but we think it's got some really interesting new ways of dealing with real time. And so here's kind of an agenda of where we're going to look at. So what we want to talk about today, or what I want to kind of talk with you guys a little bit about today, is how we can um, learn from the past, basically, how we can use this tool Cascada that we've worked on um, to build real time machine learning models um, that let you learn from what's happened in the past to kind of build models that help you understand what's going to happen in the future. Um, and so let's kind of just get started with, with, with this problem, right? Like, what are we interested in talking about here? So we've seen some really amazing stuff that you can do these days with generative AI, with these models like GPT-4. And what these models do is they've just, they've ingested a bunch of data and they've gotten really good at predicting what's going to happen next. What's the next character in this sentence? What's the next uh, token in this sequence? Um, and it turns out that this ability to make predictions about the, the future, basically, is applicable to a large number, right? We we know that it's good for language learning, but it's also useful for forecasting. Like if you want to do um, model models predicting what a particular market's going to do in the future, or make recommendations about what product a user might want to purchase next, um, or understanding when your users are on the verge of churning or are at risk of having um, a complaint or something like that. Basically, understanding what your users are doing so that you can make a better experience. And the kind of pattern here, what's common to all of these is that if you can predict the next thing that's going to happen, there are oftentimes lots of ways that you can intercede and improve that outcome. You can do something to make it better. You can keep that user from churning. Um, you can make a recommendation that a user will really want. Um, you can you know, trade against the market, for example. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity here. This is like a, an area that is very profitable and, and beneficial to businesses if they can do it correctly. But it's going to be really hard to do, especially when you're dealing with event-based data um, and using the tools that exist right now. And the reason for that is that these tools were not built to solve the particular problem of real-time data in many cases. So let me try to explain what I mean by that. So let's just look at this example. So uh, this is a kind of toy example. Let's just imagine that you work at a gaming company and you are trying to understand how you can improve the experience of your users. You have all this data and you've got some information about when people are winning, when they're losing, when they're talking to each other, when they're making purchases. When we lay this out as a table like this, I don't know about you, but it's really hard for me to understand what's happening. Like, I don't understand uh, what is motivating Aaron or like what I could do to make Brad's experience of my game better. Um, or why Carla is the only one spending money. And I think the reason for this is because we're we're looking at this data in a way that's hard for us to visualize and to reason. And so what Cascada does is it, it takes a different way, uh, a different approach to how we think about this data. And we just, let, let, let's see what happens if we lay this out in a different way. Right? So let's lay them out by time and by user, right? We've just taken this exact same information and just, slightly changed how it's being visualized. So now we can start to see the stories of these users. We can start to understand their motivations, right? So Aaron up here, we can see that every time he wins, he he posts, right? So he's probably bragging about how great he, he's playing this game, right? We can see that Brad, he just lost and he lost and he lost and he left and he hasn't come back, right? So I, I have a feeling that that comment that he left was not great. Um, Carla here, if we look at this a little closely, what we can see is that in this contrived example, uh, she loses and loses and loses and she spends money to win. So she's buying upgrades and that's allowing her to be more effective in this game. And so all of these insights, all of these stories that we're telling can allow us to build better experiences for these users, right? We can help Brad uh, by giving him upgrades or, or making the game easier for him to play so that he has a better experience. Um, we can kind of, keep Carla engaged in this process because, you know, we, we, we want to make sure she doesn't, she doesn't go away. Um, and what we're doing here is that we're looking at these events as sequences and understanding more. So order is really important here. And if we, if we talk about what it is that allows us to understand these stories, 
the fact that the purchase comes after the loss is important, right? That, that's meaningful. The fact that there's a large span of time here that happens with no events is meaningful here. That lack of data is in itself information. Um, and in order to understand these things, we need to be able to understand more than one type of data. We need to be able to pull all of these things together and understand how they interact with each other. And so this is the sort of way that we want to be able to reason about the events that are happening in our systems. And this way of thinking about things gives us a better understanding and a better way of, of kind of building the systems that is that are responsive to our users. Um, so what I want to do now is, is kind of introduce how Cascada thinks about working with data um, and, and how that unlocks this kind of better way of, of, of building machine learning models. So what Cascada does is it introduces a new abstraction for thinking about computation. This is the abstraction that we call the timeline. Um, a timeline organizes all of the data in your system by entity, user, for example, and by time. Um, and this abstraction makes lots of things easy. I think if you imagine what a timeline might be, I just say like, what does a timeline look like? You might think of something like this. It's a graph, you have a horizontal axis, which is time. And then on the vertical axis, we have points describing values observed in, in, in our system over time as, as people interact with it. So there's a couple of things to point out here. One is that we're looking at different users here. We have the blue dots are referring to what one user is doing and the, the triangles, the orange, I guess, orange, yellow triangles are describing the activities of another user. And so we have these two concepts that we think are really critical to being able to reason. One is entity and the other is time. But we're not just limited to talking about these as sets of points over time, right? Um, what we can do, because we always have this horizontal time axis, is we can start to ask questions. So we could say, how much money has each user spent, right? As users spend money, that answer gets larger or, I guess, potentially smaller if they have returns. And by plotting this out as a, as a change over time, what we produce is this continuous step function where as users spend more money, the step function goes up. Um, as they get exchanges or return their their values or their uh, their purchases, it goes down. But at any point in time, we can answer this question. It's a continuous value because it has a value at any particular point in time. And so these are the two types of timelines that Cascada works with. So when we talk about this timeline abstraction, there's sort of two flavors. The one on the left, which is what we call discrete, these describe values that are at specific points in time, and on the right we have continuous. These are generally aggregations and other things that we can answer a question at any given point in time, and therefore it's a continuous function. And Cascada works by manipulating these timelines. Um, every operation at Cascada starts with a timeline and produces a timeline. So it's this sort of like um, cyclical process where we pull data into the system from all sorts of different places. It could be streams, it could be databases, we manipulate them as timelines, and then finally we produce output in various ways. And this allows us to have a really rich set of operations that we can apply to these timelines kind of inside this red box, right? So what's really useful in building machine learning models with this timeline abstraction is there's two different ways we can think about this, right? Right now, we're in this abstract world where there's continuous functions and there's step functions and there's time axis, but we want a data set, right? We want to train a model, and to train a model, we need examples. And so one way of looking at this timeline is by saying, describe all of the changes. In other words, take all of these steps and create a data set that describes what the value after each one of these steps is. And that gives us what we call a history. Histories are really valuable for training models. You can take the history, manipulate exactly which rows are present in that history using the query language that we'll look at in a minute, and then use that as the input to your model. That's the kind of training examples that you would build a, a model from. But there's another way we can look at the same timeline, right? We can look at these exact same values, and we can pick a point in time and say, well, what is the value of each of these lines at this particular point in time? This is what we call a snapshot. The role of a snapshot is that this is what we need to have in order to make a prediction right now, right? 
I can always say, what is the value of these, these lines right now? And then I can use that as the input to my model. So we have this kind of two phase process where in the first stage, we observe the timeline across time to train a model. And then in the second stage, we observe the timeline right now to make a prediction based on whatever the current state of all of these inputs are. And what's critical here is that we're using the same extraction for both of these. There's no difference. I don't have to rewrite my code. I don't have to change the query. I, I just interpret the same um, abstract concept of a timeline in a different way based on what I'm trying to do. And so what we say here, we say this a lot at Cascada, is that abstractions matter. By using abstractions that are really tuned for the problem you're trying to solve, it's much easier to solve that problem. And so what we've seen in this section is basically how this idea of a timeline gives us new tools for reasoning about time and observing that in different contexts in different ways. So what I want to talk about next is, okay, we've got this idea. We've got this abstraction of a timeline that's kind of interesting, maybe not, I don't know. We need to be able to do things with it. We need to be able to describe particular operations that are valuable um, as the input to a model, because ultimately that's what we want to do in this case. So let's take a look at how you can manipulate timelines to actually get to somewhere that you want to want to go, right? So we talked briefly about aggregation. We'll look at this really quickly. Um, in this case, we're doing the same thing. We're adding up how much each user has spent. We start with these points. We construct the the continuous timeline. And there's kind of two ways you can express this in the, in the Cascada's query language. Um, in this first example, we apply it, make a function, we say purchase that amount and sum. The second case, which is the same expression, we just use this pipe syntax. You'll see this in most of the examples. And this is basically just saying start with the purchases amount and then compute the sum, and that produces the time. So that's not super interesting. We're going to do a sum that's fairly simple. Um, but let, let's kind of like start to add a little bit of, of complexity, here, right? So maybe we don't want to know how much the users have spent since the beginning of time, right? Maybe we're mostly interested in what they've been doing recently. And so what we can do here is that we can compute a slightly different aggregate. We can say, I want to look at how much the user has spent since the beginning of the month. So we'll have our, re our counter reset at the beginning of the month. Now, what's different about this approach to aggregation um, is that what we're doing is we're walking across time effectively and we're building that sum as we go. And so it's very easy to basically just say, when I get to the beginning of the month, start at zero, reset the aggregation and then start from scratch. And we can do that very easily at very next level in this world because everything that we are going to use syntactically is based on this idea of processing data chronologically from the beginning of time and building up aggregation this weekend. And we'll see in a minute how this kind of starts to build on itself to make some really interesting stuff. So here we're getting to a slightly different way of using these same things because what we saw previously was this example of using monthly as the trigger to reset the aggregation. And in this example, what we're what we're doing is we're changing from this monthly. So um, we're we're changing from a um, a monthly aggregation reset to use a separate set of events as the trigger. What we're saying here is I want to count how many times a user has come and viewed our page since the last time they made a purchase. Now, this is very easy to write, and I think you can hopefully understand what's happening here. So we're moving through time. Each time there's a page view, we increment a counter. Each time there's a purchase, we reset it to zero. Intuitively, I think this is a fairly easy operation to describe. But there's a lot of complexity hiding in this. Um, this, I think, is the first example that we've seen that really differs from things that are fairly easy to do in something like C. What we're doing here is we're pulling in multiple sources of events, both page views and purchases. We're aggregating one with respect to the other. Um, and we're doing this in a really easy way, right? This is a different way of thinking about aggregation and a different way of thinking about multiple data sources. Let me, let me just show you what this would look like if we did this in SQL. So I didn't write this query. I had ChatGPT write this for me. Um, there may be easier ways of doing it. I don't know. But 
this is kind of what this would look like in SQL, right? It's hard to understand. It's complex. I can walk you through it, but honestly, it's just a bunch of different tricks that you have to kind of know. Um, we're doing unions and we're doing partitioned windowed aggregations. My point here is just that this is much harder to understand for me at least than the left hand side, right? And that's because the model that SQL uses of kind of the relational algebra expressed over tables is really great for tabular operations. It's not so great for reasoning about time. It's not so great for reasoning about events that are occurring um, where there's multiple sources of events and they're all interacting. Um, so we'll come back to some of these, but I wanna move on a little bit and kind of look at some of the more interesting things that you can do, right? Um, so, what we were looking at previously was an example of aggregating based on uh, other events. And I'm gonna build up a kind of slightly more complex example um, using the same starting point. So we've got page views, we're gonna count how many times you've come and viewed the page since the purchase. What we're seeing here is that this um, translation from discrete values to continuous aggregations goes in both ways. What we're saying here is that I have this continuous expression. It's defined at all points in time, but I want to control the specific instance where I observe it. I want to just know not every time something changes. I just want to know when there's a purchase, how many page views have there been. And so I can easily apply this when function and limit the scope of the results and go back to a discrete set of values. This is incredibly useful for things like defining the points in time at which I want to construct training examples. So if I wanna say, I'm gonna use a model every time someone comes to my site, I can describe my feature set and then observe it at all of the points in time where the user comes to my site. And then I've controlled the set of results that I produce in that historical. So this is showing how we can filter down, but then the really cool thing here is that because it's, it's timelines all the way down. The result of that aggregation can then be re-aggregated, right? So I started with a count aggregation. I was counting how many page views have occurred since the last purchase. I limited that to just the times when there was a purchase. And now I can apply a new aggregation. I can compute the, the mean, in this case, or the average over time. And this ability to nest these operations is really powerful and I not to, to go back to the SQL too much, but really hard to do in SQL. Um, so as a final example, I wanna step back from the types of operation we've been doing, which have all been specific to a single user. Um, all of the stuff you've looked at, you might've noticed, it's all single user. We computed a single user's page count. We looked at that at particular points in time, but you're not limited to doing that. And so what I wanna, wanna run through now is a quick example of how you can work with multiple entities, we call them, um, simultaneously. So we'll begin by starting with reviews. We've got a bunch of people who have uh, reviewed products. And what we're going to do is we're going to change how those values are associated to entities. Instead of having each review be associated with the user, we're going to say, use the reviews item as the key for this aggregation. So we've just changed the key. We now have an expression that is computed over products instead of over users. And we've constructed a mean here, right? So now we have this value. This is a timeline. It's computed for products. And we wanna bring that in, bring that back to the, the computation that we care about for users, right? What we wanna say is when this person made a purchase, what was the average review of the item that they purchased? We want to bring these two things together and produce a new plan. This is the syntax for that. We basically start with the thing that we looked at previously. We take all the views, we associate it with the project, we compute uh, an average. And then we just say, well, look up the value associated with each purchase. For each purchase, figure out what item was purchased, and then go look up the, the average review for that item, for that product. So what's important to point out here is that the time axis persists throughout this entire process which means that I am getting the average review score at the time the purchase was made, at the exact time that purchase was made without really doing anything, it just kind of happens. Um, this allows us to do what we call point in time joins. 
where we're combining multiple data sets, but we're respecting what would have been known at particular points in time across those joint operations. Um, just to kind of like come back to the SQL example real briefly, um, here's a version of this in SQL. Again, it's complex. These, one of the things that happens when you're struggling against the abstractions of the, of the query language that you're using is that it can be fairly easy to solve one problem and it can be fairly to solve another, fairly easy to solve another problem. But as you start to compose them, as you start to build on top of them, that complexity just expires you know, oftentimes. And you end up, I don't know how often you've had to deal with uh, SQL queries that are, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of lines long. Um, they can be very hard to decompose and hard to reason about. So the net result of this is, th so this is an example that we like to show. So this was a um, on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is a notebook um, generated by Databricks for Spark, showing how to do a customer churn problem. And it is a uh, 63 pages, I think. We implemented roughly the same thing in Cascada and it was two pages. The point here is that, as we say, abstractions matter. Um, the space between the problem that you're trying to solve and the abstractions that you're using, um, that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and gets harder and harder to reason about as you try to solve more and more complex problems. Um, and so our kind of theory of the case here is that what we ought to do is change the abstractions, not the problems we're trying to solve. Um, oftentimes what you find yourself doing, or what I find myself doing at least, is trying to kind of tweak the problem statement so that it's something that I can express fairly easily or it's an operation that I can um, implement fairly efficiently using the tools I have at hand. And it's, it's much better in many ways to change the tools I'm using so that I'm using the right tool for the job. And that's what we're trying to provide with this kind of. So I'm gonna run through this fairly quickly. Um, this is just kind of a brief kind of overview of, of how we do this efficiently, how we actually answer these questions. We've looked at the abstraction, which was the timeline. We've looked at how we can work with them, the operations. And we're gonna look real briefly now at like how we can actually implement these computations in an efficient manner. And really this just comes down to the fact that because we've limited the domain of problems we're trying to solve, we can optimize really highly, really aggressively, right? Because all of our data is always ordered and partitioned, there's a number of things that we can do with that data that is harder to do um, if you don't have those assumptions, right? One of the things that we start with, and this is based on our, our kind of observation that this is really useful for machine learning, is we start with columnar compute. So we built the engine on Rust using the Apache Arrow library. And so we can compute values in bulk really efficiently. Um, um, Apache Arrow is a memory format. There's a whole ecosystem of tools being built on that. And they all have this characteristic of being able to really efficiently use CPUs um, to churn through data really effectively. Um, the second thing we do is that we take advantage of the fact that our data is always ordered um, and and partitioned to use efficient merge operations um, and kind of other types of uh, efficiency within the compute engine uh, to do that really effectively. And then finally, um, we won't get into this into into deep into this, but um, because of the guarantees and the, the semantics of the query language that information can't travel backwards in time, we can very efficiently incrementalize any computation you describe. Um, basically, any compute or any query that you make, we can compute up to a given point in time and then stop. And then if new events arrive after that, we can start where we left off and just roll forward in time. We don't have to, um, there's, there's nothing that we can't do efficiently in, in that kind of way. Um, and so we've implemented a runtime for this. Basically, uh, the Cascada engine is this thing that we built. It implements all of these ideas. Uh, it's available right now. Um, it, as I mentioned, is built on Rust and Aero. It's open source, so you're, it's free to try it out. Um, and it's actively being developed and supported by data stacks. Um, whoa, there we go. I hit the button too many times. <laughs> There we go. Um, and so 
I kind of want to conclude there, basically. That's kind of where we are. So, you know, we're really interested in getting feedback on this. We want to hear, um, does this solve your problems? Are there things that we can add to it that can make it better? Um, you know, what is interesting to you about this? What is missing from this? Um, so please, we're very interested in, you know, hearing from you guys on Slack. We've got a Slack you can join. You can go try it out on our webpage. Um, this has been a very high level talk about the kind of ideas. Um, we're doing a series of hands-on workshops to kind of get more into the actual code and showing demos and going through the um, the actual applications that the, the system can do. So if you're interested in that, sign up for a workshop. Um, those are small groups. Um, it'll be with some members of the, of the core, core team. So you'll be able to really kind of get some um, good feedback from us. Um, we're doing this, you know, both to kind of help people get better um, at the Cascada system and to understand more about people's needs and, and, and where, where we might be able to improve things. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's kind of my conclusion is please try it out and let us know what your experiences are. So, um, we can maybe I'll stop sharing here and maybe take some questions if there are any. Great. Uh, thanks uh, for the presentation. And uh, for those, uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to post in the chat. Um, and if you uh, prefer to speak to ask questions, and uh, you can raise your hand, uh, I can unmute you to, uh, to ask questions. So, and I see a couple here. Let me, I can, I can run through some of the questions in, in Slack, actually. Um, thank you guys all for these. These are great questions. Um, so Harry made a comment that in Tableau, there are some similar concepts um, and asks, can we do these in existing SQL by adding a less than timestamp? So yes, um, in some cases you can. Um, certain engines support that better than others. Uh, inequality joins um, or, no, oh, I forgot the technical term for that, but in any case, um, in some cases you can, but I think, you know, the, the point we're making here is largely that there are certain aggregations that are hard to do in that, in that world of SQL aggregations, um, you know, doing a, um, like sliding, I don't get into the detail, um, and the composability, I think, is a issue there. So I think what we're trying to do is not, we are not claiming that, uh, you cannot do the things in Cascada with SQL that you do in Cascada, um. Our goal here is to optimize for a particular use case and make it really easy to solve these particular problems of building machine learning models from event-based data. Um, and so in many cases, it's possible. It's just, I think uh, it's it's more ergonomic and, and, and more productive to, to be working to start with. Time. I to take follow-ups on that if there's any questions. Um, there was a question uh, what was the next one? Some of these are similar to the data mart. Yes. Um, uh, there's a question about can we run it on Kubernetes? Yes, we actually have in the repo, there's an example Helm chart. Um, we have Docker containers that we build as part of our release process. Um, there's a Helm chart there that you can run and it sets up local persistence, pulls down the Docker, um, sets up the API. The client libraries can work in either local mode or in remote, similar to Spark in that way. Um, if you pull down like the Python client and you just create what we call a local session, it'll download all of the binaries um, and run them locally, uh, or you can provide it with uh, an endpoint to talk to and it will talk to those. And you can have shared state across teams. Um, you can ingest data once and use it multiple places. You can have shared views. A view is basically a mapping from a name to a query that you want to you know reuse and then anywhere you use that name so it's kind of like code level reuse um since cascada has been acquired by datastax does that mean that cascada will be integrated in the datastax cloud offerings or products so yes eventually um we're working on kind of building out that system right now it's going to be part of a much larger offering targeting machine learning in general um I don't know exactly what the release date on that is. There's currently an offering that is support for this. So we have um, Datastax has something called Luna ML, which is their sort of um, support for people who want to run open source tools on their own. Um, that's in place right now. And so, you know, if you want to try this out or do a POC, um, 
feel free to reach out to me um, or the Cascada team generally, and we can we can get you connected to the people that are that are working on that. Um, there's a question: Can these aggregations be snapshot into behavior profile templates? I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, I think what we often will end up doing with Cascada is that we will use the aggregations in aggregate. <laughs> we'll build a set of features that describe um, what a particular model needs to use as its input. We'll describe that as a set of features, and then we'll write that into a feature store like um, Cassandra or Redis or something like that. And that's kind of a user profile at that point. We'll basically say, what do we know about each user as of right now? Um, so how many times have they engaged with content? Um, you know, how much have they purchased? Some of the examples that we looked at there. And that will describe the user profile, and we'll write that into a feature store as the input, basically. Uh, talking about the upper layer incremental, practically how often the computation is most likely executed. So there's kind of different ways you can approach this. So the incremental, I didn't get deeply into the incremental, but there's sort of two ways that you can run Cascada right now. Um, one is incrementally at least one is as a stream consumer and in that world we will basically just pull data off of the stream as it arrives and we'll output results to you know another stream or a feature store or whatever um and in that world the the frequency is basically you know it's there's a buffer there's a slack buffer in there so you know there's some delay of the events to handle um delayed data but that's more or less real time um the other execution mode is using this incremental processing that we're talking about. In that world, um, what we effectively do is we run the engine to completion as of a particular point in time. We snapshot the state of that operation and write it to you know S3 or GCP or something like that. And then in the future, when more data has arrived, you run it again. And that really is up to you. It's kind of one of the real benefits of this way of running is that you can make a trade-off between how frequently you want it to run, so how fresh your features will be, um, and kind of how expensive you want the operation to be, because, you know, doing it less frequently means that there's more batching involved, we're handling larger data sets, and so it's more efficient. Um, and so you can kind of trade off between latency and cost in that execution model. Um, another question was Cascada mean Cascada, <laughs> so there's a story behind this. Um, so we were, um, we started this project about three years ago. Um, and one of the people, Davor Banachi, who is involved in the beginning is, um, um, it means, is it, anyway, it means cascade. It's the, the cascada means cascade. So um, anyway, I, I'm going to stop talking for a minute and see if anybody wants to put their hand up or, or otherwise ask questions in real time. So let me just read through the comments here. Uh, sorry, uh, just quick reminder, if you prefer to speak, ask questions, uh, I actually uh, turn on the, uh, you can unmute yourself, just uh, feel free to, you know, to speak to the, ask questions, if it's easier than typing, uh, you can, you know, unmute yourself and uh, ask questions or make comments. Okay. All right. Well, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay, when more is coming on? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, can I ask a question? I finished. If you have a specific question, um, feel free to ask that. In general, what we're seeing is that on a on like my laptop, it's processing generally in the range of like a million events per second. Um, obviously that depends on the size of your events, how much data you're using for your aggregation, how complex or like what types of operations you're using. Um, certain operations are more expensive than others, but you know, our kind of like, our general rule of thumb is we're probably in the like um, hundreds of thousands to millions of events per second um, on a single machine. Have we have we measured how much more you're actually working on some benchmarks right now 
Um, and I think, you know, versus SQL is a, that's a tricky question, right? Because there's a lot of different SQLs. So, um, you know, comparing against like Flink SQL might give you one result, comparing against DuckDB might give you another result. Um, and so I think we're putting together some benchmarks right now against a couple of different systems. Um, we're actually, we've been talking with some of the guys on the Google Beam team about doing some benchmarks uh, relative to Beam to kind of look at where um, the, you know, obviously having something like Beam where it's a large distributed system is gonna be better in some cases than Cascada, which is currently a, a single process operator. Um, and we wanna kind of understand where that, where that um, transition happens because we're actually working on building a Beam harness to be able to run Cascada on top of Beam, which would mean on top of Spark or on top of Flink or on top of all the runners that Apache Beam supports. Um, and so, no, we don't have those yet, but we're working on them and, and we'll be publishing a blog post on them as soon as they're available. So feel free to you know, subscribe to our blog um, and keep an eye on that. Um, does it run only on CPU? How do you do MLOps in Cascada? So uh, yes, currently it runs only on CPU. Um, there are a number of extensions to Apache Arrow, which allow it to use GPUs, for example. Um, we haven't done the work to actually pull those optimizations in and make use of them yet. Um, I think it's probably doable, um, but you know, in many cases, what we found is that the CPU execution is sufficiently um, performant uh, that the cost of like going to a GPU-backed instance probably wouldn't actually be worth um, the benefit. Most of the operations that we're doing are sequential. We have some amount of parallelism that we can do based on the um, the partitioning by entity that we talked about. Um, but by and large, uh, the, the this is a problem that is well suited to CPUs right now, especially some of the modern CPUs that have, you know, 32, 64 cores. Um, in terms of ML ops, so that's something that we largely use the kind of, we talked about having a Helm chart. Um, there's kind of two components to, to how we handle ML ops in Cascada. Um, one is being able to deploy it um, cloud natively. Um, so once we have like a Helm chart up and running, that will do the various operations that we need. And then we also have an exchange format, which is sort of like, um, it's a YAML file that describes all of the views that you've created, all the tables you've created, all of the um, materializations that you're computing in real time. And so we have a declarative format that describes all of the resource that you want to exist. And so that can be something that you check into source control and then have whatever your kind of process that you would generally have around change management applied to that file. And then Cascada will just automatically reflect those changes kind of like Kubernetes does. Um, host has disabled your video. What about lineage charts? Um, we don't, we don't support, I mean, it's not something that we have put work into the lineage charts. Um, I think that we have mechanisms for sharing code, but they're primarily, like I said, this idea of a view. So we can have a name, we can use that name in various places. Um, we have not done the work to kind of like figure out what the dependency graph of all of those names is and figure out who's using what. Um, we have some safety features in place where like, if you have a view that's being used by someone, um, you can't delete it unless you, you know, explicitly say force delete. Um, and so we have like a certain amount of lineage in terms of just safety precautions. Um, but we haven't invested heavily in kind of more of the um, governance side of how you would do code sharing and things like that. Does it mean that clients must route their real-time streaming data into Cascada Engine? In another world, how's Cascada Engine? Um, yeah, so I mentioned there's kind of two ways of executing Cascada currently. Um, and the sort of the data model depends on those. Um, in the world where we're either doing Cascada as a batch engine, where you're trying to use it to train models, the kind of first example we looked at where we're doing historical data sets, um, in that world, the data does need to be loaded into Cascada. A lot of the optimizations that we talked about in the performance that you get from Cascada are because we can do things like sort the data once when it's ingested and then not have to ever sort again. Um, and so in that world, we, we do need to load the data into Cascada. We can load from you know S3, GCP, things like that. Um, the other possibility is to run it in real time backed by like something like, you know, a streaming system like Pulsar or eventually Kafka. Um, and in that world, we're just reading the data. We don't, we don't make a copy. We're a consumer of the stream. Um, and we compute data, um, based on that data. We don't need a copy. Of it, so. Yeah. 
All right. Any other questions? Log trace. We have tracing. Um, we use tracing extensively. We have, uh, we use, um, uh, the thing that goes into Jaeger. We usually use Jaeger for trace collection. So yeah, you can, you can set up the engine to collect traces and, and send them to a, a distributed trace collector. Um, I, am I blanking out on the library that we use for that, but it's this hotel. We use the open telemetry collector basically. 